Okay, so welcome to the launch of the Bloomsbury Academic Mass Observation Critical Series. My name is Jessica Scantbury and I'm the Mass Observation Archivist. I'm delighted to welcome you all to this event, primarily because it's the launch of the Bloomsbury series on mass observation, but also because it's the first in a series of seminars um, to celebrate the 85th anniversary of mass observation. Um, in the chat, I'll be putting a link to our website so you can find out about our future seminars and also our future events. And I'll also put a link to our discussion list where we'll be announcing these events as we go through the year. But now I'm going to hand you over to Dr. Jen Purcell, who is a, um, a professor of history at St. Michael's College. And most importantly for this event, she's a co-editor in the Mass Observation Critical Series. Over to you, Jen. Great. Um, thank you, Jessica, for that. Um, it's such a pleasure to welcome everyone to the launch of Bloomsbury Academics Mass Observation Critical Series and to be part of the Mass Observation 85th Anniversary Festival. As Jessica said, I'm Jen Purcell, Professor of History at St. Michael's College in Vermont and series co-editor. Um, and as much as we've been disparaging Zoom over all these uh, two years and probably will continue to do so in the, in the coming years, um, I think we should also acknowledge its benefits as it allows us to connect across the globe. Today, our speakers come to us from over five different time zones, um, and perhaps in our audience, we have even more time zones represented. We're excited to welcome today the authors of the very uh, first uh, books that were published for the series, Dr. Kimberly Mayer and Dr. James Hinton, who will speak to us today about their publications. And later we'll introduce some exciting projects uh, that we're currently working on and hope uh, will be published either at the end of this year or um, in 2023. Bloomsbury Academics Mass Observation Critical Series endeavors to showcase the richness of the mass observation archive, acting as a home for exciting interdisciplinary approaches to mass observation studies, and providing a space that makes the archival materials easily accessible to a wide reading audience. Um, if we can get the, um, the board up on the, oh, I see it, it's there, sorry. Um, I, uh, as you can see on the on the slide here, um, uh, you can see the board members um, and the editors, and we really like to thank our board members uh, for their work so far in launching and supporting the series. I know some of you are here today, so I just wanted to uh, uh, just send out a, a special thank you to us uh, to you for helping us out. As is evident from our two authors today, the series will feature the study of mid 20th century mass observation materials but we equally welcome and indeed encourage publications that focus on the current mass observation project or which seek to connect the mid-century and current mass observation projects. Uh, we'll accept proposals from a diverse range of formats, including academic monographs, edited essay collections, anthologies, source books, and edited reissues of original mass observation uh, publications. Significantly, rights to mass observation owned materials are covered by our series, which makes rights management for authors um, so much more streamlined and, and easier. So we're very excited about that. Um, and we're delighted to be working with Bloomsbury Academic on, um, on the series. Uh, it's been a pleasure to work with them. And uh, we do have a representative uh, from Bloomsbury today with us, uh, marketing executive, Wayming Cam. Um, Wayming, if you're there, um, uh, you can hello uh, say a few words thank you uh thanks so much for the uh intro jen um i'm very pleased to be here um the mass observation movement and archive uh has a unique and important place in modern british history uh, and its innate ability to showcase the perspectives of a wide spectrum of people um is something that uh played a really big part in making this uh, the series a really compelling, important partnership opportunity for Bloomsbury. Uh, we're really delighted to be publishing the series uh, and I'm excited for the books to come uh, and for this panel. Uh, so please take it away. Great, thank you so much. Uh, now I'd like to introduce my colleague and co-editor of the series, Dr. Ben Jones. Ben is lecturer of modern British history at the University of East Anglia. Ben? Thanks very much, Jen. Um, in a moment, I'm going to introduce my co-editor, Lucy Curzon, who's going to be talk about our forthcoming edited collection. 
But for the moment, I'll get straight to the point and introduce our authors who are going to talk about their new books. Each of our speakers will speak for 10 minutes, and I'm going to be fairly strict with timings um, uh, in order that we have plenty of, plenty of time at the end of the session uh, for questions from the audience. So uh, firstly, it's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Kimberly Mayer, who is Associate Professor of Sociology at the University of Lethbridge in Canada. Uh, her first book, uh, published in 2016, was Guerrilla Aesthetics, Art, Memory and the West German Urban Guerrilla, which uh, sounds uh, totally ace. Her current research focus on, focuses on the social theoretical history of modern care at the intersection of care and security. And these interests animate her brand new book, The Biopolitics of Care in Second World War Britain, which is uh, the, the first book in our new series. And it is my great pleasure to invite Kim uh, to speak to us about this book today. Over to you, Kim. Oh, thank you so much, Ben, for that introduction, um, as well as uh, to Jen, Jessica, Lucy, and everybody who uh, organized and is hosting this panel and everyone for joining. I'm really excited to have um, my book, uh, have it have such a good home in the Mass Observation Critical series. Uh, I think the series opens a really dynamic site for MO work, uh, both in recontextualized reissue and in and new scholarship alike. And it promises to reach those who are already enchanted with mass observation, but also to extend that reach uh, to those who have not yet had the joy and the wonder of stumbling upon the archive. And it's also really an honor for me to have my book introduced alongside James's new book, uh, as his previous work was a crucial guide for me in mine. And um, before I get uh, into talking a little bit about the book, I just want to acknowledge with appreciation the dynamic web of historical and future interdependencies in which I, as a settler, am embedded in uh, Blackfoot Confederacy territory and Treaty 7 lands from where I join you now. So, the BBC drones on about coming attacks from the sky, food shortages, evacuation, and mass loss of life. Perhaps these things have already taken shape in your dreams or nightmares. In waking hours, as you fold your linens, you try to tuck images of war into the tidy creases, but you are frequently addressed with exhortations to always act in anticipation, to carry out methodically the preparations recommended to you. The images unfurl with the cloth you spread over the table and the sheet over the mattress. Sometimes you can see them from the back window as though they were stuck to the underclothes hanging on the line, shedding radiant heat on thirsty gardens. They take up room in the pantry, occupying the spaces that your shopping should promptly fill. Posters, notices, and instructive leaflets multiplied with breathless, imperatives extending to every aspect of everyday life. Each message underlines personal responsibility, your safety and the safety for those for whom you are responsible may depend upon you. But those efforts also extended to the safety of the nation as a whole, economical use of provisions, blackening your windows, carrying your gas mask, knowing how to navigate your neighborhood in the dark, these demonstrated responsibility for the nation. My book, The Biopolitics of Care, examines how responses to the rapidly changing conditions of life under wartime civil defense tactics organized and supported sentiments of care and regimes of caregiving. It gives attention to the respective discourses, formal and informal, surrounding pets and persons displaced through evacuation. For, in for instance, it examines rumors that explicitly repudiated the supposedly improper socialization of, of evacuees and produced a salient but contested image of the host as a good wartime citizen who was imagined to be impervious to the perceived cultural contagion brought by ostensibly ill-mannered, dirty, and destructive house guests from populated towns. And the book attends to explicit contestations over the value of pets conceived as animals who do not work which placed attention on the animal companion caregiver whose responsible use of limited provisions or, or personal sacrifice to both human and non-human subjects could be judged. 
In the analysis of care in Second World War Britain and the mass observation movements interventions at the crucial intersection where care and security meets, I argue that civil defense indirectly made the home and civilian neighborhood discretionary sites in which informal asylum for vulnerable social subjects, whether human or not, would be deliberated insofar as routines of caregiving became both explicitly tied with concerns relating to the protection of the population's strength. And this is a decisively biopolitical concern because it's oriented towards the life of an impersonal abstraction, the population, the nation, the species, rather than to the concrete lives of living, breathing uh, subjects unfolding within their socially bonded groups. I just need a water. Mass observation occupies multiple positions in the book as a dynamic repository of source materials that enable the tracking of values and practices of everyday life and as a caring agent itself in Britain during the war. On the one hand, materials from the MOA provide much of the crucial uh, empirical evidence for my arguments because MO undertook dedicated documentation of wartime communications, capturing the fine textures in, located in diaries, circulars, jokes, wartime stories, gossip, and rumors. And this allows the reader uh, interesting encounters with uh, a range of these from uh, M.O. Dyer's 5390s, private admonishing of her co-worker's indulgent dog, Dandy, who allegedly ate a Cadbury chocolate bar every day and took butter on his dog biscuits during the ration, to evacuees' complaints that their hosts expected them to use recycled bath water or served them drinking water that was once used to soak uh, false teeth. So... These and others come together in discussions of their significance uh, in the negotiation of what kind of life is worthy of saving and with what considerations. And um, this is a, a kind of uh, deliberation that seems to take uh, more concrete shape, even if it's sublimated um, in times of crisis. And I think that unfortunately we've seen um, some of that struggle over the worthiness of, of, of forms of life uh, in our specific historical context of, of the pandemic. The complex ways in which mass observation observe, uh, approached investigation um, into evacuation and the keeping of pets during the war, as well as the ways that people responded to observer prompts regarding evacuees and animals instrumentally incited and really shaped the questions that guided my work with, with this book. On the other hand, mass observations, methods, social interventions, and collaborations, especially with home intelligence, at times takes its shape as an explicit object of study, as an agent of social transformation during the war crisis. One of the book's contentions is that mass observation both urged and enacted forms of public caregiving during the war. Mass observation's delivery of care, however, was fraught with contradictions, and such contradictions, I note, are uh, inherent to the concept of care, uh, as well as to the disconnect between mass observation's involvement with the motivating con contours of its participatory project and its surveillance of public feeling animated in its contract work for home intelligence, through which the nation's population was observed, measured, and acted upon for its protection in the collaborative enactment of a watchful form of care focused upon morale. While mass observations interventions may have helped administrators, politicians, and social service providers to maintain public consent by governing with more apparent compassion, the book emphasizes how mass observation performed advocacy for the mobilization of modes of care in governance and social provisions made for ordinary citizens. Additionally, it elaborates how mass observation denoted the care it gave as manifested in the work it did then, in the archive it left us, which is still living, um, and in the alternative futures it imagined, and activates one of the multiple senses of the notion of care as John T. Hamilton examined it in a positive sense in the work itself, an object of study, a work of art, or simply the beloved person for whom one cares. Mass observation itself operated from a position of caregiving, in concern for the nation, not as an abstraction, 
but as a moving field of meaningful and situated social bonds and the democratic enrichment of its public culture through participation. Thank you for listening and I'll turn it back over to you, Ben. Thank you so much, Kim, uh, for that for that talk. And um, yeah, I just it, it's a it's a wonderful wonderful book, and it it, it sheds really um, fresh light on a on a movement and a period that I I thought I knew well. There's going to be plenty of time for uh, questions from the audience uh, at the end, uh, but what I'd like to do now is to move move on to our second speaker. Uh, James Hinton is emeritus professor in the History Department at the University of Warwick in the UK. He is uh, an eminent social historian of middle and later 20th century Britain. And he will be well known to many of you for his uh, publications on mass observation itself, which have included Seven Lives from Mass Observation in 2016, and the wonderful The Mass Observers, A History, which came out in 2013. He joins us today to talk about his equally fascinating new book, Mass Observers Making Meaning, Religion, Spirituality and Atheism in Late 20th Century Britain. Over to you, James. Thank you, Ben. Uh, Rosemary, Rosemary Burroughs, which is not her real name, was a pagan priestess with a PhD. Crippled in her 30s with rheumatoid arthritis, she found meaning in her suffering in communion with the goddess Isis, who had recently been reimagined by an organization of feminist pagans. Earlier, she had escaped from the suffocating conformers of an, of an oppressed suburban upbringing when she and her husband enrolled as mature students to study philosophy at the local poly. A place, she wrote, of light and air rational argument and intellectual challenge. They both got first class degrees and both went on to gain doctorates. What a waste, said her husband's grandmother on hearing about the PhD, and we had such high hopes for him with his brains. Writing for mass observation about her encounters with the goddess and an array of other apparently paranormal events, including ghostly visitations, precognitive dreams, and astral travel, Rosemary addressed readers who might be inclined to dismiss her account as, in her words, a lot of superstitious nonsense. Can I really be having these weird experiences? And could I be deluded in some way? I'm a sane person and an intelligent one, and the experiences I've described here really did happen to me. I'm not a silly person. I've been academically trained to be rational and discriminating. When I met her uh, with Dorothy, hello Dorothy, when I met her with Dorothy a few months before her death, aged 58 in 2014, I was impressed both by her intellectual acuity and her moral strength, which posed a puzzle about how such qualities could be combined with what, nevertheless, as a lifelong atheist, I could only think of as a lot of superstitious nonsense. The puzzle rankled, and this book was the result. Mass observers are good to think with. I first discovered that 20 years ago, and in two volumes of biographical essays, I've used their writing to probe the forces shaping modern selfhood. In the course of that work, I interviewed Rosemary Burroughs, and that led to the present project, looking across the whole range of the 279 mass observers who, in 1996, responded to a mass observation directive about attitudes to the supernatural. Since the 1960s, as the leading historian of religion in modern Britain points out, the precipitate decline of the Christian churches left matters of existential belief among the population at large wider open than at any time since the 17th century. Alternative spiritualities flourished and atheism advanced. The mass observers, puzzling about such matters with their usual freshness, openness and honesty, 
provided a unique insight into this extraordinarily diverse landscape of belief and disbelief. Using the responses to the supernatural directive, alongside other writing from the same individuals, the book probes how the mass observers handled notions of the supernatural in a variety of situations, in their responses to death and bereavement, in the ways they understood the relationship between the practical instrumental reason underpinning science and technology, and the existential meanings that we conjure up in our imaginations in their attitudes towards apparently paranormal phenomena. And finally, in those rare moments out of time, when they found themselves overcome with sensations of awe, wonder, or sudden enlightenment. What's apparent in all these dimensions is the degree to which both attitudes and experience overlap the frontiers between the believers and the non-believers. The ways in which the mass observers articulate their feelings about life's larger existential questions reveal how much is shared across the divide between those who invoke the supernatural and those who do not. While religion is not hardwired into the human mind, the search for meaning does seem to be an essential part of the human condition. Thinking with the mass observers led me into dangerous waters, not because it threatened my cradle atheism, but because the scholarly literature on the place of religion and the process of secularization in modern Western societies is something of a battlefield, polarized between proponents of irreversible secularization and those who, while not disputing the evidence of Christian decline, detects signs of post-secular re-enchantment. Those with religious faith, who tend to congregate in religious studies departments, accuse atheist writers of being deaf to matters spiritual. Atheists, congregating in sociology departments, accuse believers, in a phrase calculated to raise the temperature, of secularization denial. Situating myself somewhere between these two in battle cohorts, I drew fire from both sides. In the end, despite my own atheism, I seem to have appeased the believers rather more than the atheists, the more dogmatic of whom tend to throw out the baby of meaning with the bathwater of religion. Thus, an anonymous reader of an earlier version of this book dismissed the mass observer's existential puzzling as evidence of their own unrepresentativeness, asserting, rather crudely, that, quotes, the majority of the population cannot be asked giving five minutes thought to such concerns. While the mass observers may be unusually thoughtful and articulate, there's no reason to think that the need to find meaning in life is restricted to such people. As I dug into the mass observer's writing, Rosemary's superstitious nonsense took its place within a spectrum of processes by which all of us, believers and non-believers alike, seek existential meaning. Alongside our extraordinary capacity to engage in practical ways with the world about us, we have a hankering for the metaphysical, which is not to say we're all aspiring philosophers. Immersed in the everyday routines of getting and spending of work and play and family life, most of us, most of the time, appear indifferent to any larger meaning to our existence. Adolescents may agonize about existential meeting, meaning, and old people may review their lives in search of it. But by and large, by and large, adult life, cluttered with the practical and the mundane, manages without metaphysics. Nevertheless, the need for meaning is there in the background, as much a matter of feeling as of thought, a sense that life is meaningful, despite our inability to articulate 
what the meaning might be is essential to psychological well-being. We are meaning-making animals, suspended, as the anthropologist Clifford Geertz puts it, in webs of significance that we ourselves have spun. Confronted by the unfeeling immensity of a universe from which, it seems, we emerged only by chance and in which humanity will have probably only a fleeting presence, we make meaning by telling ourselves stories about who we are and what we're for. The myths by which we live as nationalists, rationalists, humanists, socialists, no less than Christians or believers in new age spirituality, are to a large extent works of the imagination. We find meaning in life because we have the ability to see what is not in any material sense actually there. Perhaps in the end, it doesn't matter very much whether our sense that life is meaningful rests on supernatural or merely natural forces. Either way, the sense of meaning depends on the exercise of the imagination. And if it is the case that it's only through the imagination that we can find the meaning that we crave, then we should treat each other's imaginative, imaginative constructions with respect. Nothing's to be gained by claiming that our own deepest convictions are so irrefutable that all reasonable people must embrace them. I realize, of course, that this conclusion skirts philosophical depths with which, as an empirical historian, I am in no way equipped to deal. When it comes to ultimate existential questions about the meaning of life, the universe and everything, I'm as puzzled as anyone else. This book is not a philosophical treatise. It's an empirical account of the variety of ways in which a bunch of unusually thoughtful and articulate people in late 20th century Britain imagined their way out of meaninglessness. Thank you. Thank you so much, James, for that wonderful introduction to a wonderful book. And thanks to yourself and, and to Kim as well for, for packing so much of interest in, into just 10 minutes and, and keeping so well to time. Thank you both. Um, my, the, the final speaker I would like to introduce is my, my, my colleague, um, Dr. Lucy Curzon, who is Associate Professor of Art History at the University of Alabama, and she is going to talk to us about a forthcoming uh, special, uh, sorry, a forthcoming edited collection. Uh, over to you, Lucy. Thank you, Ben. Um, uh, as Ben said, <clears throat> this is an edited collection which Ben and I are editing together. Um, at present, the title is The Historical Context and Contemporary Uses of Mass Observation, 1930s to the Present. Um, and it will be one of the first edited collections beyond anthologies of original MO documents and special issue journal publications like the 2001 New Formations volume to focus specifically on mass observation scholarship. Perhaps more significant though, is that unlike previous publications, which tend to focus on mass observation in its first phase from the late 1930s through the early post-war period, or but much less so from the post-1981 mass observation project, the historical context and contemporary uses of mass observation examines both periods of mass observation, forging new connections between them, establishing, in other words, the sometimes distinct but often overlapping mutual social, cultural, aesthetic, and political, among other contexts of their development. Mass observation has, of course, expanded beyond its foundations in anthropology by developing firm links to the study of literature, sociology, history, life writing, film, visual culture, and cultural studies, to name just a few of the relevant fields. The essays included in the historical context and contemporary uses of mass observation highlight many of these connections, often more than one, in fact. In so doing, they emphasize the vibrant interdisciplinarity and critical thinking that lies at the heart of the mass observation critical series, and indeed at the heart of mass observation itself. 
As you can see here on the slide, the scholars included in the collection similarly represent a variety of perspectives, from sociologists to art historians, and from early and mid-career researchers to established voices in the field. Finally, like other volumes in the series, including James and Kim's volumes, to which we've just been introduced today, the historical context and contemporary uses of mass observation aims to make the history and significance of mass observation, both the original phase and the mass observation project, not only accessible, but also relevant and perhaps increasingly relevant to a wide range of academics and students across multiple disciplines, as well as the general reading public. And with that, I'm going to hand it back to Jen. Thank you, Lucy, for uh, telling us a little bit about your volume. I'm so excited to see uh, that published and uh, to read those essays. Um, I wanted to introduce um, a, a new um, uh, work that is coming out through the series that will be our very first uh, reissue. This is the 1937 um, original uh, pamphlet from Mass Observation, entitled Mass Observation, and it should be uh, published late this year or early next. All series reissues emphasize context and analysis and will include at least one introductory essay along with annotations to the original text. <clears throat> this reissue of Mass Observation includes two original and insightful essays by a professor of cultural studies at Sussex, Dr. Ben Highmore, um, who's here with us today. Hi, Ben. Um, and research fellow in cultural sociology at Cardiff University, Dr. Rachel Hurdley, and a collection of interviews about the early days of the Mass Observation Archive at Sussex, conducted by myself with Dorothy Sheridan, who's also here. Hi, Dorothy. Um, Nick Stanley and Penny Summerfield. Um, I'm also excited uh, to announce work that I've been doing with Dr. Fiona Courage, uh, director of the Mass Observation Archive, on an anthology about observers' attitudes regarding royalty. And Fiona will now share um, details about that volume. Fiona? Thank you. Um, as I'm sure many of you realize, Mass Observation was very much... Um, one of its founding reasons was based around royalty and love them or hate them. It's something that has punctuated mass observation for the last 85 years. It's been a constant in British life. So I'm going to ask you all to think, I'm going to make this interactive. You can worry now. I'm going to ask you all to think, for those of you that were alive then, what were you doing on the 29th of July, 1981? You don't need to answer, just think about it. And what might you have been doing on the 29th of April, 2011? I know what I was doing. I was having a barbecue, drinking far too much champagne, and I suddenly discovered that I quite liked the royal family, having thought I wasn't going to watch a wedding. I don't know if anybody else was the same. And likewise, for the 19th of, of May uh, 2018, I'm not going to ask anybody what they might have been doing on the 12th of May 1937, but I'm sure that that's a date that you will remember will be um, Mass Observation's first official um, um, project uh, which was to chart the activities of people on the day of George the sixth coronation so that's what me and Jen have been looking at for the last couple of years and what we're working on at the moment is all of those punctuations of royalty that have, have gone through the last 85 years and how they've been represented in mass observation um, and we're going to be putting together a um, I guess a compendium of what these observations have been uh, both of the people participating in, in watching royal events, those who are ignoring royal events and choosing to do lots of gardening instead, or those that have very strong opinions in one way or the other. Um, we're hoping that that comes through in um, Jen. Uh, Your 2023, we're, yeah, we're looking for 2023. Mm -hmm. And for those of you that are quite turned off by the idea of reading all about the royal family, what I will say is that if you want to know about what Britishness means, if you want to know about um, class representation, um, or if you just want to know what people like to eat, because as we know, mass observation often has an awful lot of discussion about food in it. Um, this is going to be the book for you. That's my sales pitch over. I've got to go and write it now. <laughs> Thank you, Fiona, for that. Um, and now um, I would like to just um, introduce uh, historian of 20th century Britain, 
director of the Institute of Historical Research and a trustee of the Mass Observation Archive, Professor Claire Langhammer, um, to say a few words about the series. Claire. Thanks, Jen. Um, so um, I wanted to start by just kind of saying something that's, I guess, quite obvious, uh, but hopefully not too, too stupid. And that's that publishing um, and publications have been right at the heart of mass observations practice since its very beginning. Um, you know, the texts that are being reissued were issued um, by mass observation because of its um, deep commitment to communicating knowledge and understanding to the widest possible audiences and to diverse audiences, whether through the press, um, through radio or through particular publications. And one of the real joys for me about this series is the way in which it's going to allow us to um, look at some of those publications um, with fresh eyes um, through the edited, the, the supplementary material that's going to be added to um, some of the original publications, um, to see them through the lens of, of new scholarship um, and through critical introductions. So, you know, we all have, I think those who work with mass observation, all have our favorite publications from the past. Um, my own is, um, is The Pub and the People, um, perhaps for obvious reasons. Um, but to see these texts kind of given new life is going to be an absolute joy. Um, and it will be lovely to see which ones are picked up and, and, and looked at again, um, and which become the ones that kind of aren't looked at yet. And, and then perhaps there'll be a clamor for particular texts to be reissued in the series. Um, but of course, as well as mass observations own kind of enthusiasm for, for publishing its own work, um, there's also been a lot of um, scholarly work done on mass observation over many years. Um, work such as, I mean, James's work has already been mentioned, uh, but of course, Nine Wartime Lives was just a wonderful um, text. Jen's own work, Domestic Soldiers. Um, Dorothy Sheridan's critical engagement with mass observation over very many years, um, and her, her just outstanding um, text, Writing Ourselves, which I think really just gets to the heart of what the mass observation observation project is. And of course, work by people like Nick Hovell, um, Ben Highmore, who's already been mentioned, Tony Kushner, Annabella Pollan, the list is, is long, um, which kind of raises a question, which is, there's a lot of mass observation out there. Um, why do we need more of it? And I think the answer lies in the archive. Um, mass observation is this extraordinary archive for the study of modern British history. Um, it kind of gives you everything. It gives you a window into the self, as many scholars have, have shown so beautifully. Um, it gives a window into people's relationships, intimate relationships, workplace relationships. It gives you a window into politics with both a small and a, and, and a capital P. Um, it gives you a window on the world and people's attitudes towards other countries, towards other peoples, towards other leaders, um, but also their sense of what politics actually means in their everyday life. Um, so I think, and, and as the volume that ben, um, ben and Lucy are putting together shows, there are lots of new ways in which people are engaging with mass observation material, both that generated in the mid-century, that generated since 1981, um, and sometimes putting those two moments together um, in really, really creative ways. I wanted to just linger a little bit on um, the fact that this is a critical series. You just linger on that word, critical. Um, when I first started teaching um, mass observation, I was teaching a course which Dorothy Sheridan had put together called Critical Approaches to Mass Observation. Um, I mean, I learned everything I know about mass observation from Dorothy, um, including how to teach it. But this sense of the critical and the critical distance was so important in that course. And I think important still today. Those of us who work with MO 
can kind of fall in love with it. Um, and I, I loved um, James's phrase that mass observers are, are good to think with. And they really are to think with their own analytical framings of their lives, of other people's lives, of the world as they see it. Um, but I think it's also really important that we um, enter those worlds um, through a critical lens, you know, um, and that we engage with, with our worlds critically. So I very much welcome um, this series. I think all scholars of, of modern Britain will, will welcome this series, um, both in terms of the new scholarship and in terms of the reissues. And I want to congratulate um, the editors um, on the series. Over to you, Jen. Many thanks for that, Claire. And of course, I think we should recognize the important work that you've done um, in, in mass observation um, in, in many different formats. Um, and I am um, definitely uh, beholden to you for my entire career. Claire was my uh, PhD advisor. And so it's just so lovely to have you here and, um, and to speak to um, what was so important, I think, in putting together this series for us, um, the, um, the fact that so much has already been written, um, it, um, it's only the tip of the, of the iceberg, really, as, as Claire's mentioned. There's just so much more, and um, the, the series may seem wide and wide-ranging, um, but I think that's because it's reflective of, of the archive itself, and what we wanted to do with this was to really underscore that and the interdisciplinarity of it. There's, um, there are some disciplines who've only just, just started to engage with it or only just engage with it in a little way um, that I think there's so much more we could do um, and that scholars could engage with in, um, in the archive. And, and so I'm hoping that, and, and the, uh, the board and, and Ben and myself are hoping um, that we will excite scholars uh, to want to participate in this um, and to publish with us um, as such. Um, we've got the, our uh, call for proposals um, that I wanted to put up on the screen before we open it up for question and answers um, and just want to mention um, that we welcome any and all um, mass observation related proposals for the series, obviously sort of hooking into um, that critical nature of the series. Um, if, if you are interested, please contact um, myself, uh, Ben Jones, or our um, history editor with Bloomsbury, Rodri Mogford, um, with questions about or proposals for the series. Uh, and as I mentioned before, I, I think it's uh, one of the great benefits of writing for us um, that the series has rights to all mass observation uh, own materials. And I think that's, um, that's a really critical piece for us. Um, and, and we're so appreciative of Bloomsbury uh, for working, working the, all, the legal, um, all the legal ease out for that.